So I'm going to ask that you turn to the book of Romans, chapter 8. And I'm speaking tonight on uh, groanings too deep for words. Groanings too deep for words. And what that means. And so, in the book of Romans, uh, chapter 8, uh, I'm going to read several scriptures. But let me explain first something about the ways of God. And when I say groanings, the word groaning means to sigh. It's like with grief. Uh, it is to cry. Mm -hmm. There could be an inward sighing, groaning. There could be outward. Uh, in the garden, it says that Jesus uh, prayed in the days of his flesh with, uh, with prayer and supplication with loud crying. Now let me tell you something before I share this. And, and I never thought about it much, as much about it until recently. But God wants us to know Him. Did you know that? I mean, God wants us to know Him. And He said, if you know the Son, you'll know the Father. But you know that scripture that says, and now may the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Was he talking about his son Jesus? Or is he talking about himself? I think he's talking about both. But God wants us to know him. And to know him is to know his ways, it's to know his character, it's to know his attitude, it's to know how or who he is. It's to know him intimately. The word know means to know intimately. And so let me share with you many ways of God, characteristics, but let me share with you a way that you may not be so aware of. There is something about God that He responds to the cry for help. Did you know that? In fact, He will answer the cry for help almost quicker than any other prayer. And you'll find that in Daniel chapter 8, when they cry out to the Lord. You know, there's some other appeals. They appeal to His name. They appeal to His word. They appeal, appeal to the reputation of His holy city. But first of all, they cry out. Now, this is part of the nature of God. God responds. He's even within us, in the fallen creation, there is still that uh, reflection. There is still that yeah, reflection of that cry, that nature. Okay, let me just, before I go on, let me just share what I mean further by that. You'll find in many, many passages of Scripture, but in Psalms 40, David's testimony, verse 1, he said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined to me, which means He reached out His hand, and He heard my cry. Mm -hmm. In Psalms 107, one of the most important chapters for me through the years has been four times in distress and turmoil, and you can read it yourself when you're really down, when you're going through difficult. Go to Psalms 107, and, hundred, and there are four times that they cried unto the Lord, and He heard their distress, and He brought them out of it. Not only other scriptures, Psalms 34, I think it's verse 17, 18. It says, God is near to those of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. So I think we all hear the cry of God in in uh, when Israel was in Egypt, it says they heard their groan. God heard their groan unto Him. So are you are you sensing? Are you getting that reality that God hears the prayer of the cry of His people, the groanings of His people? It's part of His nature. It's part of who He is. Well, in the Book of Romans. I'm going to begin in verse 26, but I'm going to back up from that in a moment, but I'm going to start there. It says, in the same way. What does it mean, same way? In a moment, we're going to look at it. Because there's two other examples of how he's going to show that groanings work. So I'm going to come back to that. But in the same way, the Spirit, he's speaking of the Holy Spirit, also helps our weakness. That's usually when you groan, when you're down, when you're pressed, whenever you're you're in dist uh, distress, when you uh, in our weakness helps uh, in the same way the Spirit helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray. I think the King James says we do not know what to pray for. As we should. Have you ever been there? You're so down. You're so distraught. You, do, you don't even know how to pray. Well, this is what he's talking about. As we should. 
You know why we don't know how to pray? Because we have so much disturbance. We're, we're so into what we think and so in anxiety and pressure that oftentimes what we'll do is we will pray out of our soulishness instead of out of our spirit. And the result of that, it says, uh, this is a confidence that we have before God that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And we know that if He hears us, we have a request which we have asked of Him. For we're asking Him according to His will. But guess what? When we're in distress and we're in pain, don't we often ask, not so much out of His will, but it's what we want to happen. It's more often out of our will than God's will. But when we pray in His will, this is a confidence we have before Him that whatever we ask that's according to His will, He hears us, which means if He hears us, it will be performed. Now, I only know one real secure way to always pray in His will. And we're going to get into that tonight. And it goes on further in this. Uh, it says, uh, uh, and He, so it says, we pray, we do not know how to pray as we should, verse Six, but the Spirit Himself in us. Do you realize what that means? The Spirit of God Himself. What happened in the beginning? In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. The earth was void without form. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. Do you realize how powerful the Spirit of God is? The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead also quickened our mortal body. We're talking about the Spirit of the living God is in us. The Spirit Himself intercedes for us, now notice, with groanings too deep for words. Now, before I go further and give exegesis on that, I'd like to back up to verse 18 because there's two other times that groaning is mentioned. But this is the only time it says groanings too deep for words. Mm -hmm. I think there's a verse that says groanings which are too, uh, cannot be uttered. But, but I've done a study before mm -hmm. and today again. It's very interesting. He says it's too deep for words. Because the other two times doesn't say that. So let me try to go through it. Rather not I'll use this. I'm not sure. But let me go through it and, uh, and kind of look at it and see what it's saying. So Kind of hold that in place and go back in the same chapter, go back to Romans chapter 18, verse, verse 8, but verse 18, same chapter. Mm -hmm. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation, the anxious longing, this is a whole creation which eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Now that's a powerful verse and we're, we're going to look at it in a moment. The anxious longing. Did you know that the creation is longing? What are they longing for? The revealing of the sons of God. What's the revealing of the sons of God? The manifestation. It may surprise you when we look at it. And then he goes on to say, for the creation was subjected to futility. Not willingly. You know why? Because when God created the earth, to separate the waters from the firmament, or the firmaments, and then the dry land, and, and all of the plant life, and find the fish life, and with all of that, with the sun, the moon, the stars. You can read it in Genesis chapter 1. But it says, The creation was subjected to filth and not willingly, because of him who subjected it in hope. Well, guess how it was subjected? Because God gave man dominion. But man forfeited that dominion to sin. And it's been subjected to corruption. And, and that's true. And so it was subjected though, but because of him who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption. I mean, it all corrupts eventually. Uh, it will spoil with the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now we know that the whole creation, the earth, the animal life, the bird, the whole creation, here's that word groaning again, groans 
and suffers the pains of childbirth. Just to kind of keep that word childbirth in the back of your mind. Together until now. Now, not only this, but we also ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, here's the second word, grown within ourselves, ah, listen, waiting for our adoption as sons, the redemption of the body. That's, that's a new word uh, for some. The word adoption is not found in any other writings except Paul. Because Paul, though he was Jew, was a member of the Roman Empire, of, the, of Rome, a citizen of Rome. And adoption is, very important to remember this, is a term that was used by Rome and Roman law. So it's not the word we use for an for adoptable baby. It's a different word. It's a different meaning. And, and I'm going to show you what it means. I'm not going to say they could adopt it, but, but when he speaks of the adoption, he says the adoption is as sons. It's a real key word. Just mm -hmm. keep it in mind. We'll come to it. Mm -hmm. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is a hope. For he who hoped for what is already seen, uh, for who hopes for what is already seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, uh, with perseverance we eagerly wait for it. Now this is not a hope. Oh, I hope so, but rather it's a hope that is pursued and set fast in Jesus. Now then he says, in the same way. So he gives really three examples of groanings. Uh, that, and only one of them, he said, is groanings deeper than words. And so I'm going to just list them up here so you'll be aware of them. First of all, he says the creation is groaning. Did you know that? The creation. Did you know that seismologists have proven that there is a continuous tremor that's going on in the earth? Mm -hmm. Everywhere. It's groaning. Mm -hmm. Now, not only is a creation as the earth, but all the things in the creation. Mm -hmm. Isn't it interesting how that, that this nature, the creation of God, is manifested? Have, have you read on the first book and so on Facebook, rather, and uh, you'll, you'll see men who spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars, maybe even thousands, to go hunting. All of their hunting equipment and gear and transportation and all the animals that come. Find a little animal that's frozen, caught in a frozen pond. What do they do? They'll spend hours rescuing it. Find something caught in a fence and entangled. They'll spend hours. There is something in the reflection of God's creation of the human heart that hears the cry even of an animal. Want to save it, want to protect it. The creation is groaning. You know why? Because it's under a curse. There's a cry. And that cry will be answered. There's a millennium, whatever your belief may be, but uh, there will be a millennium and uh, which the Lord shall reign and we shall reign with him in different views of him. But uh, it'll be a wonderful, glorious time. Mm -hmm. But until that time, the creation is waiting for something to happen. <clears throat> now notice, all this ties together. There is a groaning of the creation. There is redemption. But what they're waiting for is the revelation of what? Ah, what does that mean? Sons of God. So, I don't want to spend too long on this. I mean, actually, we could go several messages on probably in time or in the future we will. But let me explain about the Son of God. Uh, so, let me kind of go back to the scripture in the book of Romans, chapter 8, in, in which it says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willing, but because of him who subjected in hope, that the creation itself will be set free from the slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruit of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves. Notice, groan within ourselves. There's a creation groaning. There's a groaning within ourselves 
waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of the body. What in the world does that mean? Creation is groaning. It's groaning right now. But it's waiting for something. It is waiting for the revelation, the manifestation of the sons of God. But guess what? We ourselves. We have the first fruit of the Spirit. That, you know, that's like a down payment, a guarantee that we're the Lord's. Even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. That's what Paul speaking. What in the world does that mean? Major, major. Let me tell you what the adoption of sons is. And, and I'm going to, if you'll turn to Galatians chapter 4. Let me explain it. Often people talk about raised and abused or rejected. They receive the spirit of adoption. And you know, I understand what they're saying. They receive that spirit of acceptance from the Lord Jesus. We're accepted beloved. But let me tell you what adoption meant when Paul wrote this. The word adoption was a legal term that you could be born in a Roman family. You had an inheritance from all that the father had. But you didn't get it as a child until he saw that you had that mature equality enough. Usually it was about the age of 30. How was Jesus when the father said, this is my beloved son? And am I well pleased? Usually it was about the age of 30 that they, they were already a child. See, many believers today are children of God. They've been born again because you're a child by regeneration and relationship. But the word adoption has to do with a status. And when and the Roman government, the Roman law, they actually had a legal document that said when the father believed that you were at a certain age mature, that in that legal document, it was an adopt, it was a, a document of adoption that you would be adopted as a son. And that son gave you the right to an inheritance that had been given to you. You were you were recognized as mature adult. You follow that? Now Galatians chapter 4, it will explain it. Verse 1. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. See, Jesus said, and, and he gave them power to become sons of God. Well, to become that. So when you're born again, you're a child of God. There's no question. But guess what? A child is no different at all from a slave, although he's owner of everything. Because when you're first born again and you're a child of God, <coughs> is what he says. He is under guardians and managers until the day set by his father. So also, when while we were children, hey, Paul knew this experience, when we were children, we were held in the bondage under the elemental things of the world. What in the world are the elemental things of the world? Well, Colossians chapter 2. If you've died with Christ, why is it you were living, uh, you were living in the world, uh, subjecting yourself to degrees such as taste not, handle not, do not touch? That, that's what a child, don't touch that hot stove. Watch it, don't do this. It, it's do's and don'ts. Because of children. You were living under those when you were children. That's, that's how many Christians start. You find people real legalistic is because they're still children. And, and that's a part of it. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his... Now, not all of this is a personal sense, but it's in the sense of all of Israel. 
because they were a figure of the Son and of His church. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born of the law. See, they experienced that as a nation. So that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive, what? The adoption as sons. Because you're sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, heir through God. And I'm not going to speak on this next part tonight, but I'm just reading today. There's about four or five major characteristics of when we end, we come to that position of a son. In one sense, you're a son of God. Only in the sense we've been born in the family of God. But there is a growth process, a spirit of adoption that we cry, Abba, Father, and you enter into a whole different realm. I don't know, many of you may have never heard that before. One of the first person I ever read, even thought much about, it, was a man named Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones, probably one of the greatest uh, evangelical teachers uh, in this past generation. He was pastor of Westminster Chapel, kind of the prince of the pulpit among evangelicals. Probably his most famous book was The Unshakable Kingdom. Remember that in Martin Luther or Jones. And uh, I was stunned when I began. I thought, well, I never thought about that. Yet here it is, all through scripture. And you know what? There are many Christians today. In a sense, they're a son of God. They've been born of him. But they're still children. They are the they, they compare themselves to one another. Gifts are like little toys they play with and don't know how to handle. And Paul says, when I became a man, I put away childish, then, childish things. It didn't mean he didn't stop using them, but learned how to use them in a mature way. And it, it's one thing to be a son. Now, I can't tell you exactly how to know when you reach that place. You'll no longer be children tossed forth uh, to and fro with every wind of doctrine. You will no longer be jealous of one another. That's just a difference. You will enter into a new inheritance. I know the name of God will be written on you. I know you enter into an inheritance of things you've never experienced before. It's a new dimension. Many wonderful things. I pray that the glory of the riches of his inheritance will be seen in you, your experience. You know, most of us think, oh, I have an inheritance from God. How many of you know that God has an inheritance for you? That's why he doesn't get in you. I used to speak a lot on Anasalusa, on how to know your destiny, how to know the counsel of the Lord for your life. And you know, I teach spiritual gifts. Sons and daughters of destiny. How God uses your your worst mistake and for your greatest mess. All those things. They're good. They're right. And then one day the Lord says, God, you're showing people what I plan for them. For their life here and destiny in this life. But did you know not only do you have a place here for ministry? but I want you to know your place in eternity. That may be a little far out. That only happened a few weeks ago. It's beyond anything I ever imagined in all my life. I still can't already talk about it. I go and prepare a place for you. I know that, that also indicates in this life, our soul life has been so greatly shared here. But I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive it to myself. There where I am, there you may be also. I know I can refer to here, but guess what? Every one of us has a destiny in eternity. There's a place, a place in the council of the Lord. I never thought about that until the Lord began to show me. God only showed me a little bit because it was too overwhelming. I, I just sat stunned and crying. I never knew of his love and passion for me. 
I felt good before someone said my passion and love for him. But when he showed me, he said, I want you to see my plan for you in place in eternity. Amen. You see, as you come into that dimension of adoption, mm -hmm. we're in the relationship with children. We're already born again in his family. But that adoption is sons to receive our inheritance, to have his name written on us. Wow. So that's the second. More, much, much more can be said. You understand that. But that's the second groaning. Now, I want to kind of finish up. And I think I can do it fairly, fairly quickly with this next one. And uh, I want to go back to uh, Romans chapter 8. Uh, and, and then verse 26 again. So we've looked at the world, the earth, the creation. We've looked at waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. Oh, well, there was one other point I meant. I knew there was something. I've shared this testimony before. You see, whenever we enter into that dimension as the adopted sons of God, there's a new dimension. The first time I ever encountered that was in Tacoma, Washington. No, not what's another? Not Tacoma. Um, across the hills. I know I should look this. Anyway, I was in the state of Washington, and uh, a man lived there. Was it in L.G. Lake? We had a healing minister, great healing minister. John G. Lake, thank you, John G. Lake. Had a great healing ministry. You've heard of healing rooms around the nation? That's where they came from. And uh, uh, I've, I've shared this story once or twice in the past, but let me share it again, because it really says something. Uh, I actually spoke in the church that come up the tabernacle. They originally, I believe they said, for Billy Sunday for someone to preach there. And this is where his congregation was. And I preached there and uh, years ago. And after I preached, the associate pastor came to me and he said, I have purchased a home that I want you to come visit. And he said, this is the original home of John G. Lake. And people used to come there to his living room for healing. And when I walked in, it was like the walls were pulsating with power of healing. It's awesome. And then he told me something. He said, it took me a while to find this house. It was old and kind of run down when he finally found it. But he bought it. And then he put about $100,000 more into renovating it. And there were people that didn't like it and, and were posed and then put graffiti and stuff on it. But, but it almost drove him out of his neighborhood, but he just kept and stayed there. And, and uh, they were so tired, but had it done. And they were going to take a vacation. Now, this was John G. Lake's home originally. And when they left, they planted tomato seeds in a, in a place they prepared next to the garage outlined by these railroad ties. Two weeks or three weeks later, when they returned, and they showed me the picture, and the pastor and some of the staff members confirmed it. The tomato seeds had sprouted. They had grown up the garage side and had large ripe fruit tomatoes on them. Wow. That's the power of resurrection. That's the firstborn sons. That's the adopted sons. That's that's a power. The same man had a facial because of a stroke, a facial distortion. One day a young guy came to his house and said, God told me that, that he wanted you to go out to John G. Lake's grave and to lay on top of it and pray. It was a heal you. Now I wouldn't tell anyone just do that anyway, okay? You'd have to really hear God to do that. Because it could kind of sound a little bit off. But it was, a, it was an icy day. So it was about an inch deep. But he said he really felt God told him to do that. There had been a paper, a, a, a picture of him in the paper of this distortion. And he was paralyzed. And he went out, got on his face, prayed. And guess what? He was healed. Now, that's not going to happen if God doesn't tell you. But anyhow, 
the power, the revelation of the sons of God. You know why? Because when the, whenever the revelation of sons of God come forth, they will even effect the creation wherever they are. Maybe limited until the final revelation, but at that point, it will actually change where they are physically in the creation. Are you aware of that? A few years ago, there was a film of transformation. One of them was in Guatemala, a little village. There were two jails because of the crime. The church had almost died. Witchcraft was rampant. And people began to pray, and the glory of God began to come. Guess what happened? Not only did they have to stop the jails, no one was being put in them. Churches, several churches began to grow. Witchcraft was almost non-existent. But the most interesting thing, the land and the crops began to revitalize. And carrots that had grown about a hand's length were now growing almost an arm's length. I've seen pictures of them. Instead of one crop, they had multiple crops. They were buying Mercedes trucks to haul the, the vegetables in and out. The same thing happened in a community up in Canada. Linda Prince uh, was very aware. They'd gone with her to uh, Israel when, when they would help celebrate certain days. This was First Nations people. You see, wherever the spirit of adoption comes, it's like there's an authority to take back the land. Maybe in a location. Maybe it's where you have legal right to own I don't know. But there are some instances where communities have been changed. But where it doesn't happen, guess what? Daniel and I were talking about. In Leviticus, it says, wherever there's iniquity, when it's full in a land, the that land will spew the citizens out. Wow, that's a pretty heavy thing. That land must be not the citizen. I'm not, an, I'm not an expert at all. I just have friends who have been in quantum fixes and studying the power of prayer. It's awesome. But they've understood that, that even objects, walls, floors, record our attitudes, our thoughts, our words. Think about that. That's the reason Satan is such an accuser of the brethren. In my own life, I went back through the years in prayer and I began to ask the Holy Spirit wherever there were wrong thoughts, actions, whatever, that He would cleanse even the physical places by the blood of Jesus. I think there's power in that kind of prayer. And so it is that wherever Christians who have that authority as spiritual sons and daughters, I think there's a power in prayer to even bring forth the revelation of the sons of God and cleansing at least to that limited place of creation. No wonder creation is groaning for the adoption of the world. In the same way, verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps our weakness, but we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. The others doesn't say it's too deep for words. I think the Christian groanings are simply the creaking, the groaning, the voice of a little animal, the cry, whatever it is. The voice of man. We're waiting. I think our voice <coughs> is help. In fact, it says in Revelation that uh, uh, about tribulation that will come. The whole world will be tested for one hour. But, but he talks about us having the word of perseverance. And one has it, God, what is that word of perseverance? That you will be tested. And you know what the word was of perseverance for Jesus in the garden? Not my will, but that be done. 
And I think in perseverance, whatever may happen, it's like, God, what is your will? Not my will, but yours be done. And I, begin, I think you'll begin to tell us. Amen. See, that's what brings you to sonship and that adoption of power. That's what the whole creation is groaning, waiting for the adoption. Now he says the redemption of our body. I think it's, it's I know eventually our body's going to be changed like unto his. But I think even this side of glory, there, there can be some change in our body. There's a change from the power of sin. There's a change from certain uh, sicknesses and, and weaknesses. Doesn't mean we can't get sick. But there's something that changes. I've recognized in days past, there were certain areas of addiction. It's not that I overcame them like I used to, but it's like, it just weren't there. It's different. It's like a quantum leap. I was thinking of that today. I've ministered to men and women in pornography. And I mean, it's been a vice grip for years in their life. I've read statistics that are kind of scary. But you know what? But it's like, when this starts happening, even there's a redemption of their body, of their lives, of a whole church. It's not like, I will not, I will, I won't. It's not that. It's not that it's resolved. It just begins to dissolve. You think, hey, what happened to that? I can't explain it. But it's a new dimension of the heavenlies. And I, I need to conclude. So let me. And then he says, and he who is the Lord, who searches the hearts, knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints. You notice saints? Plural, not just singular? Yeah. Because when God begins to work in our life, often it involves several people. It isn't just me, mine. It's a whole dimension. Yeah. And we know. We know. See, a lot of people quote these verses. We know that God works all things together for good of those who love the Lord. Well, they just misquoted. They just left out something major. It doesn't just start out, we know that God works. Out. No, it says, and we know. Don't leave out the and we know. Because the and we know ties it to groanings in the spirit. But what is it groaning? The earth tremors. There's groanings. The sons of God. Oh God, not my will, but thine be done. Oh God, let this come past me. Nevertheless, not thy, my will, but thine be done. Oh God, teach me thy ways. But this is a kind of a groaning. This is what it is. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Remember that? If we ask anything according to his will, so we know this is going to be answered. And we know that God causes, not that he makes everything happen, but he causes this wonderful heavenly work of God who, who makes a whole galaxy work together in such precision. The same God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For he, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn. I'm going to mention something and then go back to do to be for words. I'm not going to teach on predestination now, but a few times it's mentioned. I think it's mentioned we're predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Ephesians 1 5 says you're predestined to the adoptions of son in love. Predestined means that God works everything ahead of time. He knows what they are, but He's predestined you to grow up into Him. Now, I end with this one. He says that He prays within us. The Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, one verse says, too deep to be uttered. 
So I did a, years ago, I first kind of heard this, not too much self teaching, but from Jack Hayford, who was pastor of a great church in California. And, uh, and I, it really, it, it rung true. So through the years, I kind of kept it there. And then I began to do the research myself. And I thought, what does that mean? Too deep. I used to think about, oh, God. I can, God can hear that. But here it says, too deep for words. And, and when you go, you can go to the Strong's, and it'll give a meaning, and then there's usually a root that that meaning comes from. So I went to the roots of root that that meaning comes from, and it says, it's too deep to say, to give words to it. In other words, it's not any word that you can articulate. You can't prove, there's not an articulate word for this kind of groaning. Then what must it be? The Holy Spirit intercedes. Well, I'm telling the Holy Spirit intercedes in tongues. That's what First Corinthians is about. I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with understanding. In the Spirit, you pray in mysteries. So let me tell you what I've done. I do it, I do it often now. But when I feel this groaning, now there's other reasons for praying in tongues, for interpretation, for from revelation, knowledge, prophetic teaching, all those. But there have been times when I felt such a burden on the Lord. I'm not knowing how to pray. And what I will do, I will pray the Holy Spirit. I know when it's Him, with groanings to deep for words. And here's how it'll come out. I'll begin to pray in tongues by the Holy Spirit. And all I know is, here's what happens. And we know that all things, God works all things together. He begins to orchestrate. See, it's for the saints. He knows what the will of God is. He, he knows what the will of the Lord is for the saints. And knows the mind of the, the spirit of the heart. Because when God answers something, it may not just be me, my will, me. It's probably going to orchestrate a whole group of people. And he orchestrates it together in his timing, in his way, for his will, for his purpose. Begin to try it. And when you don't know how to pray, begin to pray in tongues. As the Holy Spirit groans within you, if you, it's okay to pray with your mind, but if you're like me sometimes, I pray more out of my own will and God's will. And when I pray in tongues, I know it has to be His will. He who knows what the will of God is. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went to the hospital, what, two weeks ago? It's the most awful pain I've ever experienced. And I was, oh, I heard, I heard, you know. And one of the guys says, why don't you pray in tongues? I don't know why I didn't thought about that. But I began to pray in tongues. That didn't mean to believe. You know what? I knew that God was answering. And it's interesting how he orchestrated. And they didn't find any major obstruction. They never knew exactly how to call my doctor. Uh, it, was, it was a wonderful cardiologist. Of course, he... You know, he's a man of medicine. I feel like we're becoming somewhat personal friends. Mm -hmm. And he said, Don, I have ministered to three men, pastors, this week. Yeah. And he said, I believe every one of them has been a demonic attack. Mm -hmm. And he said, I think yours wants to. And I think when I started praying in tongues, doesn't mean I don't go to physicians, I do. Doesn't mean I don't take medicine, I do. Doesn't mean I can't get sick, I can. But when I do, I learn to start praying in tongues. Mm -hmm. I can tell you many examples. Did you know that when you pray in tongues, you edify yourself? Pray, edify means to restore. It's also restoring the body. When I was wearing a boot, just because my heart was falling down, could have been a pretty horrible final result. 
and almost every morning for a while, I would pray touching my foot, and I would pray in tongue. It was interesting. The tongue kind of began to change. It's almost like a marching thing. And then I would pray, and I still today, I pray uh, for different parts of my body in tongues. Because I don't know how to pray sometimes. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. But with groanings too deep for words. I was praying this morning about, or this afternoon about the church. There's something, I don't understand how to pray. But I began to pray. And sometimes in a language, sometimes in a tongue. Words are tongues, groanings too deep for words. So, let's bow our heads before Him.